As the conflict in Ukraine drags on and the death toll mounts, another round of peace talks ends with no progress. So, what's next? Hello, I'm Arnon Naidoo, and this is The Heat. The foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine met Thursday in Turkey, but the talks ended without any breakthroughs. In Ukraine, Russian forces are advancing, cities are being surrounded as the population tries to flee the region. Philip Crowther has more from Lviv in Ukraine. The Ukrainian military says that Russian forces are in control of several cities in the suburbs of Kiev, the same places that are still being attacked by Russian forces right now. There has been further Russian shelling of cities like Kharkiv in the north of the country. There have been airstrikes in the likes of Mariupol in the southeast of the country. And at that exact same time, there were supposed to be ceasefires and safe passages organized for civilians to get out of besieged areas. Only in very few occasions are these uh, ceasefires actually holding. There were supposed to be six today. We don't know yet whether those, held or whether those were held or not. But according to the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, only three of those were used yesterday. Now let's take a look at the city of Mariupol, besieged for nine days now by Russian forces, with around 200,000 people believed to be in dire need of getting out or of receiving crucial humanitarian aid. The problem, though, according to Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Irina Voreshchuk, is that humanitarian convoys on their way out of the city with civilians in theory supposed to be on board those convoys are being attacked by russian forces so that dire need for those civilians to get out is still very much the case and it gets getting more and more difficult to get humanitarian aid in and to get those people out philip crowther cgtn in lviv ukraine there is a lot to discuss. Let's bring in our panel from Kyiv. Ina Sovson is a member of the Ukrainian parliament. Here in Washington, D.C., Anton Fedyashin is a history professor at American University. Also in Washington, Max Blumenthal is editor-in-chief of The Gray Zone and an award-winning journalist. And Fred Tang is the president of the America-China Public Affairs Institute. He joins us from New York. Welcome to all of you. Let's go to uh, Ukraine. Ina Sovson, uh, as I said earlier on, there have been peace talks, and these took place at a pretty high level. It was the foreign minister of Russia and the foreign minister of Ukraine, but nothing came of those discussions. And I would imagine Ukraine is under heavy pressure now to get some kind of resolution to this. There are people dying. There are people fleeing the country. Cities are being destroyed. Where does this go to from here? Well, to be honest, uh, there was very little optimism about those talks here in Ukraine, and I believe the whole world can understand why it is so. Because basically the story is as simple as that. Russians want us dead, and we want to stay alive. There is very little middle ground between those two states, between being alive or dead. So, so we did hope that potentially we would get the humanitarian corridors for particularly the city of Mariupol, which is under siege and, and people are dying there. We got reports that over uh, 1,200 people died in the first nine days of the blockade there. And then the recent attack on the maternity and child hospital was, of course, another level of evil that even we didn't expect here. So we didn't really have much hope for, for the talks. Uh, we do believe that uh, at the end of the day, the solution to this crisis, to, to the war, uh, would be military. We do have to fight back and kick them out of our territory. We do not believe in diplomacy, mm -hmm. and I don't think the world should believe in diplomacy from Russia. Every time a Russian official is opening up his mouth, he's about to tell a lie. And I think those blatant lies recently told by Lavrov, who claimed that they didn't attack Ukraine, are just as obvious uh, to the whole world as they are to us. So we truly do not see much in terms of uh, diplomatic solutions to the war that uh, Russia launched upon our heads. So you ultimately think there will be a military solution to this. But does that not run the risk of Ukraine being damaged and being destroyed of a lot of people dying? Well, uh, that is what is happening right now. And uh, ultimately, right now, it is up to the Ukrainian army and to the support that we expect to get from the West. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, Russia attacked Ukraine not because uh, we did something wrong. Russia attacked us because we, we 
are part of the Western civilization. So we are now protecting the, the Western civilization, Europe uh, overall, and we do expect much support from Europe uh, in order to be able to fight against this barbarism of, uh, of Russia. So uh, yes, we do hope for a quick solution, and we want that to be a full victory for Ukraine. We are within our right to expect uh, our sovereignty, mm -hmm. and we are within our right to expect support from all the countries who do believe in the, uh, you know, that Ukraine is in its right to respect uh, its sovereignty. So yes, we do hope uh, that we will have a military solution, very little hope for diplomatic solution. Russia is just lying all the time. You cannot have diplomacy with people who are lying. Okay, let me go to Anton Fedyashin. Anton, uh, we just heard there uh, from our guest from Ukraine that she believes the only way this could be resolved is militarily. What's your view on that? Well, without direct NATO uh, support for Ukraine, if uh, the military solution is the only one, I'm afraid that we will be looking at uh, a multi-month uh, engagement, uh, if not a multi-year engagement. Um, I don't think that, uh, that this is really going to benefit uh, Ukraine, Russia, or Europe. Um, the, we're now all locked, especially Europe, of course, and first and foremost Ukraine, in an attrition uh, um, situation, uh, both military um, and civilian slash humanitarian and uh, economic. Uh, the um, the Kiev-based uh, weekly Zirkola Nidili, the the mirror of the week, a uh, weekly mirror published um, what looks like um, Russian demands. There are six of them now, and there's little new in them. Um, I don't know how this is going to to turn out, but I'm also fairly pessimistic because this could drag on for a long time, and the, the economic devastation in Ukraine is going to be palpable and uh, very difficult to uh, fix. Um, it sounds like the Europeans are nudging the Ukrainians to start um, compromising. Macron came out and said today that uh, EU membership, or rather the path to, it, to the EU, may be a consideration but not while the war is going on. This may be interpreted as a signal to both sides to right. start talking. But again, it's too early to tell. Anton, uh, this war has now entered the third week. Uh, looking at the conduct of the war thus far, is Russia under any pressure to reach some kind of a diplomatic solution soon? It is, uh, both militarily, because the original plan, uh, if there was one, uh, for a quick surrender by Ukraine clearly did not work and is not uh, working. Second of all, I don't think that the Russians expected the uh, severity and speed of the sanctions, although they were clearly prepared for uh, a roll-in. Um, so for Russia, this is an unprecedented uh, situation in that it's completely isolated from the West uh, diplomatically, which is completely understandable. It's also uh, increasingly isolated from the West economically. And despite the fact that it does have some resources to stay afloat, this is a question of time, which is why I brought up the question of attrition. Uh, look, Putin's popularity in Russia, such as it was, rested on a very very simple, tacit agreement with the population. Political quiescence in exchange for stability, for the freedom uh, to travel, for the freedom to read anything that people wanted, and moderate uh, economic growth. All of those are now off the table because of this conflict. So uh, Putin also has a limited amount of time, despite the short-term rally around the flag effect that I'm seeing in some uh, media and uh, uh, social um, uh, you know, sites. But this is not going to last forever when millions of people are unemployed. Max Blumenthal, uh, the United States and its allies are pouring weapons into Ukraine right now. One cable news uh, television channel here in the United States said that up to 20,000 missiles have been sent to Ukraine. They include javelins and stinger missiles. There was talk of providing Ukraine with jet fighters, but that seems to be off the table right now. Question is, do we know where these weapons are going? Who's getting them? Is there any kind of accountability? Where are they going? Well, I assume many of them are going to go to the good folks 
inside Mariupol, like the Azov Battalion, which, according to the FBI, is a neo-Nazi organization that proudly flies the Wolf's Angle symbol, uh, inspired by Nazi Germany. These are people who Congress put a block on in 2018, a block on arming. And I actually got to interview the congressman who uh, created the, the pressure to block the arming of the Azov Battalion. That was Representative Ro Khanna the other day, 48 hours ago. And he told me that uh, he supports all the arming of all of these groups now, that it is a just war, and he wants to see the conflict escalated. So, I mean, you can follow the telegram channels of the various local Azov battalions. They have javelin missiles. They have light anti-tank weapons supplied by the UK and other um, countries. And these are overtly neo-Nazi battalions who will lead the counter, the insurgency that many elements in U.S. intelligence want to see, a Syria-style insurgency. And I wanted to quickly comment on another kind of war. It's the information war. Uh, yesterday, we heard at the Senate, Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland, the neoconservative author of the 2014 Maidan coup, declare that they, she is working with tech companies to censor information that she considers to be false. And so we've seen the uh, Russian embassy in London booted off Twitter today for sharing an image of the uh, known Ukrainian beauty blogger Mariana Pod Podorskaya at the site of the uh, bombed maternity clinic. Uh, claiming to be a victim, and she was photographed by a famous Ukrainian photographer named Yevgeny Mololetka. So they were suspended for saying that. ASB Military, another very known, uh, well-followed uh, military account on Twitter, was booted after sharing video of Kharkiv residents begging the Ukrainian military not to place howitzers next to schools. So apparently this was considered false, or maybe it just contravenes the official narrative. And at the same time, Facebook has now authorized calls for violence against Russians, as well as praise of the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion, something Facebook previously had banned. So we have to assume the U.S. government, and specifically the State Department, is working with tech companies to propagandize the U.S. public into supporting the escalation yep. of a conflict yep. that will likely lead to a, a Syria-style insurgency if the U.S. has its way. All right, Max. Uh, Ina Sovson, I want to get. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to. When ask. you are. I don't know why you are doing that and why you are saying what you are saying right now, but we are being bombarded by airstrikes daily. Every day, I read the news of Russian airstrikes uh, hitting Ukrainian residential areas with children dying. And you are here speaking about some Nazis. You are speaking about someone creating some images on Facebook. Those are not well, you images. Well, know, you know them well. We you know them well because well, I, uh, you're the speaker yeah, of your Ukraine. parliament was one of them. The speaker of the Ukrainian Rada, Andrei Perubi, is the founder of the neo-Nazi Patriot of Ukraine. He was an open well, supporter of Stepan Bandera, not a collaborator. You know these people better than I do. Because has not been a speaker of the parliament for three years now. Update wow. your information. Well, sure, well, you knew him before. Did you have any problem with that? An open Bandera being speaker of the, of the parliament. Of the parliament what does before? that have anything to do with that? And well, how you would you comment on people blowing up residential areas? They are blowing up residential areas here in Ukraine. And you are sitting here and talking about some Nazi groups? Seriously, don't you want to comment on people who are blowing up residential areas in Kyiv? We have all, all, already 70 sp uh, children died here in Ukraine because of the Russian well, I'll leave strike. that to you, and I'll comment on people being blown up for the last eight years in residential areas in the Donbass by the Ukrainian military with the support of my I, government I, I, and my I, tax dollars, which is the context Russian of this. Russian propaganda that you are talking about now. We didn't kill a single person in Donetsk. And people Donetsk not is in Donetsk. Max, see this chance to finish. This is the problem, Anand, that any facts that contravene the official narrative get called Russian propaganda. And so Americans cannot understand the context for this conflict. We only hear the Ukrainian nationalist the narrative now. Eight years All right, of war, else? Russians killed 14,000 Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. That is the number that is confirmed by all international organizations. United you don't Nations have any data. Okay, one moment, Max, let it finish. The fact that Ukrainians have been killing people in Donetsk or Luhansk. The only people I, who are claiming that Ukrainians have been killing people in Luhansk and Donetsk are Russians. So please tell us what you are yeah, watching like, for. Because no, that is clear that that is part of the Russian I'm propaganda. The, the whole world Nations. is now Okay, I want to move on. Max, make your point, and then I want to move on. 
The United Nations keeps a tally of those who have died in the Donbass conflict. And since 2017, 81% of those who have died have been on the pro-Russian side, according to the United Nations. Not according to me, not according to the Kremlin, according to the United Nations. And this, again, is the problem, that facts get denounced as Russian propaganda. Because military. Okay. Yes, we are killing the military who are fighting All right, against Max, the Ukraine. All right, Max, Ina, I've got to move on. I've got to move on. Ina, I've got to move on. I'm going to get to Fred Tang uh, in New York. Uh, Fred, uh, let's talk about uh, China's role in this. China has, for a long time, had a policy of non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. Uh, Beijing has also criticized the use of sanctions against Russia. Let's listen to the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Waving the stick of sanctions will not help solve the Ukraine issue. Practice has long proven that sanctions will not only fail to solve problems, but will also create new ones. They will not only cause lose-lose or multi-lose situation economically, but also hinder the process of political settlement, which is truly non-constructive. My apologies, of course, that was the spokesman for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing. Now, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, he also told us that Ch Russia is our most important strategic partner. So, Fred, what does this tell us about how China views this? Well, first of all, I, I am an American, but uh, I could talk about in terms of China's view. Uh, uh, let me do say to Ms. Uh, Solfson that uh, all of us uh, feel uh, any citizen, any human under war zone, the tragedy that they're going through, we feel for it. Uh, but uh, I do not think that a military solution is the best solution. Uh, I understand where you're coming from. I know Max as well. Uh, in terms of China, uh, as many of you know, they voted extension, extension vote uh, in the UN, and they were criticized for it. But actually, 35 countries have uh, voted abstention in that same uh, resolution. I think China, what they would like to do is to see peace. Because right now, when there's a fight broken out, I think that talking about who's right, who's wrong, and all this, uh, yes, in the long term, we can uh, sort all of that out. Uh, right now, we need to stop the war. We need to stop the fighting. And I think that's the most important. Whether it's military or civilian who die, it's tragic and has long impact. Uh, and, and I think both, I think Mr. Putin has made a miscalculation in terms of what he's doing. And uh, it's, uh, it's hurting both sides right now. Anton Fedyashin, these are very harsh sanctions that have been imposed on uh, Russia, and I'm sure they must concentrate the minds of those uh, in the Kremlin right now. What kind of effect is it having? Well, it's having a devastating effect on the currency, which, of course, is uh, what affects uh, all Russians. Companies are uh, suspending operations in Russia, although, again, um, according to French uh, news, when Emmanuel Macron met, uh, what, either early last week or last Friday with members of French business, he told them not to rush out of Russia. In other words, the European expectation is that this will be over eventually and people will come back in. But the damage is very real. Um, uh, th this affects, of course, uh, every ordinary Russian because access to uh, technological goods, um, stuff that everyone takes for granted, things we use in uh, households, uh, refrigerators, washing machines, uh, everything, uh, irons, all of that is uh, becoming more expensive. And of course, Russia has been cut off uh, technologically from Western uh, chips. Uh, the Chinese will make up for some of that um, as they can help out with some parts of uh, automotive building. But in general, listen, uh, this is very serious. Uh, anyone in Russia who thought that this was not going to happen was uh, deluding themselves. But on the other hand, uh, there are already calls in Russia to move towards a more balanced geo-economic policy. 
and to uh, to trade more deeply with the rest of Eurasia and to welcome back Western businesses when they do return on terms that are favorable to Russia. But before we get to all of that, again, this uh, war of economic attrition is something that the Kremlin uh, has to take very seriously and is taking very seriously. And we'll see how it turns out because there's absolute war is such a contingent event that it's absolutely impossible to predict right now what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone a week or a month from now. You know, Solson, of course, these sanctions have been imposed against Russia that has not stopped the war right now. Uh, Ukraine has been calling for a no-fly zone uh, over the country, but NATO says, no, that's not going to happen. And the reason for that is because that would put them at war with Russia, and that could escalate to a nuclear exchange. So what do you make of that? Do you feel uh, that this no-fly zone should be imposed? And what about the risks of this turning into a much larger confrontation? Uh, well, again, every day we do hear news about Russian airstrikes against residential areas. Uh, just an hour ago, I heard a, a report by the mayor of the city of Mariupol, which has been under Russian blockade for nine days now, with no heat and no electricity. And he says that during the day, Russian uh, air jets were flying over the city of Mariupol every 30 seconds, bombarding the residential area. In my native city of Kharkiv, uh, the mayor reported that uh, 400 uh, buildings have been destroyed in Kharkiv during two of the airstrikes. That is what is killing Ukrainians right now, both civilian, military, children, uh, elderly population. And that is why we are asking for a no-fly zone, because we are fighting on the ground pretty well. We are actually managing to uh, stall the Russian army on the ground. But what they're doing to the civilians, to our infrastructure, is just unbearable. And we are asking for a no-fly zone because of that specifically, in order to be able to have a winning chance on the ground. Uh, we do get a uh, quite decent number of support uh, from the West, but that is not enough to ensure a no-fly zone. And at this point, we are not even asking for anyone to intervene in terms of ensuring a no-fly zone. We are just asking to give us the technology that is necessary in order to make sure that our pilots would uh, secure the, the sky over Ukraine, just given the jets, air defense system, so that we can ensure a no-fly zone ourselves and so that uh, the Russians stop killing our children every single day. Uh, that is a crucial issue for us. Uh, that is something that we are uh, discussing with the West uh, uh, again and again. Uh, we are disappointed with the level of progress that we are seeing as of yet. We do hope that the West will reconsider and will see Russia for what it is. It is not a, just a threat to Ukraine. Putin already claimed that he doesn't like Poland in NATO, he doesn't like Hungary in NATO, the Baltic states, of course. Uh, so, so if he devastates Ukraine fully, he will proceed further. And I think the West is starting to understand that. And that is why we are getting the support we are getting at this point. But that is not nearly enough to ensure safety of our sky. And I'm sure I, uh, I, we are one in the morning here in Ukraine. I'm, I know for sure that I will wake up in the morning uh, tomorrow and I will learn about new airstrikes uh, killing more civilians. That is why every day of delay in, in, provide, in helping us ensure a no-fly zone is actually uh, results in new death, um, including those of children. But do you recognize why NATO is so reluctant to impose a no-fly zone? I, frankly speaking, don't. I do not accept the excuses or the explanations that were given, because uh, if, uh, well, primarily, uh, Ukraine did give up its nuclear weapon in 1994 mm -hmm. in exchange for assurances from the United States, the United Kingdom, that in case someone is threatening our security, they will protect us. That's one of the reasons why we do feel betrayed right now, because had we had nuclear weapon right now, we would have been in a completely different situation. There's secondly, uh, this argument that we don't want to escalate. Well, to what point it's not escalation? We already know that the Russians have been using cluster bombs here in Ukraine. They're threatening using chemical bombs here in Ukraine. What is not escalation? Like, how many deaths do we have to wait until we know that, okay, that is escalation? Okay. Let, me so, ask so, Max, so, let me ask Max about that. Max, uh, the Russians have been accused of using cluster bombs in Ukraine. Uh, there's also... There's been a lot of talk recently, over the past 24 hours, actually, about the use of chemical weapons as well. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not laughing at the 
the pro the use of any of these weapons. It's lamentable if they are used, but the uh, allegation of the potential use of chemical weapons really reminds me of what we saw in Syria. And so let me address this idea of the no-fly zone, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, a no-fly zone, as is understood by the Biden administration, uh, is a call for would amount to conventional war with a nuclear power in Russia. It would require the United States to not only attack Russian aircraft in the air, it would require attacks on Russian anti-aircraft missiles that are very sophisticated, like the S-300 inside Russia. It would also uh, could uh, cause attacks inside Poland, which is being asked to supply MiG-29s to the totally vanquished Ukrainian Air Force, which has no command and control. It is a not only it's a delusional fantasy uh, because the United States and its uh, allies, if you can even call them that, are or I would call them their junior partners, are uh, not interested in a conventional war with a nuclear power that would be a disaster. And so you have an element in an extremist element in Washington yeah. among the neoconservatives and you have in the Ukrainian government who are trying to trigger this. And we are likely to see some kind of allegation of a chemical attack like we saw in April 2018 in Syria, in Douma, mm -hmm. which was clearly a staged event as the Organization for the Prohibition Chemical Weapons inspectors on the ground have clearly demonstrated. Okay staged in order to trigger Western missile strikes and a no-fly zone. And we have to be aware of the possibility, I would even say the inevitability, of these kinds of incidents to trigger Western intervention when the West wants to right. do no such direct intervention. OK, Fred Tang, uh, the Chinese the President Xi Jinping. One moment. One, one moment. You know, I just want to go to Fred Tang for a moment. Uh, President Xi Jinping, he has had conversations with the French President Emmanuel Macron, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. And uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has been holding talks with the foreign ministers of France and Italy. The South China Morning Post reports that European governments are looking to China to broker peace. Um, do you see China playing a bigger role? Can China break the deadlock here? I think that what China can do is really just to bring the two parties together. Uh, earlier, you, you talk about the sanctions. Uh, Putin already been sanctioned over 5,000 times. So I think sanctions is not going to be working. Uh, the, the other is negotiation. Most of the negotiation, when they first started, none of them work. It is keep on going back to the negotiation table and finding both sides what they're looking for, and they can compromise something, and then they will get, get things done. And, and so, so in terms of President Xi Jinping, not only Macron and, and the German, but they also talk to Ukraine and Russia, I believe, uh, as, as well. So they're trying to earn this in terms of okay. helping, helping that, yes. All right, in a very quickly, I've only got 20 seconds, make your point. Yeah, well, just from Russian propagandists hearing this uh, notion that Ukraine can be using chemical weapon against its own population is unthinkable. I don't really anyone should uh, seriously take this notion, and and okay. it just it's a pity that this is being repeated right. over okay. again. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We have run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of the Heat. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington D.C. Thanks for watching.